We are underway. Eric, the floor is yours. Awesome. Thanks so much. Glad everybody could make it today. It's a great group. Um, we have probably, what, 20, 20 or so, 25, something like that. That's great to see. Um, so a couple of things we're going to get started with today, guys. We're going to jump right into this because we really have about an hour. Um, and I normally take a little bit longer to go over lead generation. Um, so a couple of things. Does everyone have a notebook with them? Give me a thumbs up if they do. Love it. Love it. So if you're not taking notes, grab something right now and make sure you are because you're definitely going to want to make sure you, you can come back to these at any moment. While you're taking notes, something that I highly recommend is going through there and actually writing some ahas. So we're going to be sharing our ahas during the day. And what I do when I'm taking my notes is I'm actually going to just star it and then just, just put a little aha so everybody can um, share what they know and what they've learned from today. Uh, it's always a good way to go back and have a reminder later on. Um, so let's go ahead and get started. Um, the goal of Spark, are you guys familiar with what the Spark goals are? All right. So what we're going to do is one of the goals through Ignite is going to be in the next 30 days um, setting an appointment. I'm sorry, in the next two weeks setting up an appointment and have their have your first contract in the first 30 days. Um, so no matter where you're at in your, your career, if this is your first day or you're 10 years in, we still want you to find at least one new piece of business to go under contract and set an appointment in the next two weeks. So we're going to be talking about the best thing, which is how to set those appointments today and how to find them. So we'll be going over that, but have that as a goal, right? Right at the top. The goal is to set an appointment in the next two weeks. So why don't we go ahead and unmute you guys. What would you guys feel um, if you set an appointment in the next two weeks that you wouldn't have had otherwise unless you actually went after this? I'd be pumped. <laughs> absolutely, absolutely. So how much money is our average commission in our office? Mike, do you know? I'm sure yeah, you know. It's, uh, yeah, it's uh, just under $6,000. Right. So if you guys implement what we're about to talk about um, today, and if you implement, because I always talk about education without implementation is just merely entertainment. And we're not here to just entertain. I hope it's entertaining as well for everyone, but we want you to take this, go outside of the room and implement this. I know many of you are doing this, um, but you know, if you actually go out there and implement this, what would $6,000? So I want you guys to write that down, $6,000. Where would you spend it? You can either type that in the chat box or you can just go ahead and. Um, I know we just moved here and bought a house recently and had to do a ton of repairs. So I would use it to pay off our, our new shower. <laughs> Absolutely. That's a nice shower. It sounds like if you're spending that amount. Um, of money. <laughs> it, it, yeah, no, it wasn't. It, was it turned a into more, a bigger project. Yeah, a little more in depth than just the shower, but. <laughs> That's the way they go. Um, so vacation with the kids, I hear. Love it. Um, you know, experiences are something that we cannot get back. Um, pay off car note, love it. Bills, paying down bills, absolutely. Hardwood floor refinishing. Oh, awesome. Debbie's getting specific, and that's what we're looking for. So that's awesome. It could be that you guys want to end up, um, you know, buying your first investment property. Sophie just shared that she ended up just getting another investment property, um, just put it under contract, what was it, yesterday? This morning. This at morning. 7 a.m. This morning at 7 a.m. She's muted because she's like 10 feet away from me, just enough to be socially distant. Um, so investing, absolutely. So love it. So let's continue to move forward here. So in Ignite, we're going to do this a little bit different. Normally, I say there are five main activities that we're going to be doing as real estate agents, and we're doing it a little bit different today. So I want you guys to write this down. There's, we've talked about this before. There's growing your business and running your business. Um, the majority of agents who don't make it in the business, where, where is their challenge? Growing it or doing it? It's growing, Sophie said. And that's 100% correct. So it's getting the business, which we're going to be talking about today. So I want two categories, left and right. We want grow on one, run on the other. 
So Gromming would be lead generate for buyers and sellers. That's number one. Number two is going to be make seller listing presentation and get listings is number two. Number three, make buyer presentations and get listings. And number four is going to be previewing real estate. On the running of the business, um, you know what, we're not going to go over all these today um, because I don't want to take up too much time in the power. There's about nine items. Um, we'll cover that in another session. So today, what are we going to be focusing on? It was number one there. Lead generate for buyers and sellers. So let's go ahead and um, talk about this. Now, many of you that have coached with me for a while know that I'm big on scheduling. If it's not on your schedule, it doesn't exist. It doesn't exist. That's exactly right. So write your next note should be, if I want to lead generate, the first thing I need to do is put it in my schedule. It's pretty simple. We just need to put it in our schedule. So the question is, in the last week, I want you to write this down. In the last week, how much time have you lead generated? And write down that number. Mike Ferry, a uh, real estate coach, I heard him speaking one time and he said, you know, a lot of real estate agents believe that they should be able to work a very small amount of time. And that is true. You can work a small amount of time and do very well in this industry. But he said, if somebody were paying you $100,000, would you at least show up to the office for two to three hours a day? And the answer is absolutely. And we need to be doing that same thing. So, uh, so is that number that you've lead, generate, lead generated in the last week, is that acceptable to the income that you're looking to produce? We've got more people joining. How are you doing, Candace? So I, the, the not, last question to this is, how much time do you want to spend lead generating every day? And there's no good, bad, right or wrong answer. If you want to say five minutes or five hours, it's somewhere between there. The only thing that I'm going to recommend is making sure you don't get crazy into like, I'm going to do 10 hours a day of lead generation. Um, if that's really not something you're going to do, then you know, don't, don't even write it down. Take this very serious. If you're going to spend a half an hour a day, one hour a day, two hours a day, whatever that looks like. All right, so we're gonna be going over a couple different things here. We're gonna go over another four parts of the lead generation model, um, which is going to be, well, I'm sorry, we're, we have lead generation model we're gonna be going over. We're gonna go, going to talk about how to lead generate. We're gonna be talking about a database and a sales pipeline. How many of you know what a sales pipeline is? Show of hand if you know it. If you've coached with me, you better know what that is because we talk about it all the time. Every day when you wake up, that's your biggest goal. It shouldn't be what's going on with a home inspection or something like that, getting tied up into those types of items. We want to talk about, you know, how many people did we add to our pipeline today? Um, so anyways, we'll continue to move on. Um, we want uh, daily habits to be built. Um, so during bold, raise your hand if you've taken an in-class bold session before. All right, about half of you. Um, all of you then know what a bold 100 is. If you don't know what a bold 100 is, that's where you contact 100 people in, in one day, in one 24-hour period. It's uh, 100 two-way conversations. That doesn't mean you just left 100 voicemails or dialed 100 people. That's 100 conversations. That is a difficult task and yet it does help. Um, we've watched people stand up at Bold and say, you know, I did a Bold 100 and I made $25,000 in potential gross commission in one day. Um, and it's, it's insane what that will do, not to mention further down the line, what type of activity that will receive, um, you know, for that client from different types of 
uh, referral opportunities and things like that. With that being said, said, Jim Rohn has a famous saying of an apple a day keeps the doctor away, seven apples in a day will make you sick. So we want to make sure that we're not pushing too hard into just like a bold 100 every day or we feel bad that we didn't do four hours of lead generation. Wherever you're starting, make sure it's something that's repeatable and something you can do as a daily habit every single day. Um, anyways, we're going to be talking about script practice, lead generation, and um, contract practice. Um, more now than ever, there are two challenges around contracts. And I was on the phone pretty late last night helping out some agents. Um, so number one is how to write a purchase agreement. Many of us know how to do that. Number two, what is the big change that's happening with Keller Williams right now? Sophie said it, it is DocuSign and it is coming. Um, Mike, how many more days do we have? Uh, what is today? Today's the eighth, so seven. Seven days left. Now, what our team, Ryan and I and Taylor, have decided to do as of like three weeks ago, we decided to jump into this and we are writing the majority of our contracts in DocuSign. Why do you think we're doing that a month before it's mandated? Well, Kim, I see you talking, but you're muted. I'm gonna unmute you. Just so we can be ready. And we don't have right. questions. And right, and we also have a crutch that if Ryan or I, all of a sudden it's 10 o'clock at night and we're struggling with DocuSign for some reason, like I was last night on one of my own deals, um, we still have the ability to run back to dot loop real quick. In a week from now, that is not going to be accessible. So what can we do to change that? We can practice every day. Um, spend 20 minutes in there. It's not that bad of a system. I know a lot of people have like looked at it as a change, but I've been doing this long enough. Anytime there's a change, people just panic. It is a great system and there's actually some unique features that are really nice with it. So keep working it, keep practicing it, and don't use it as a, uh, don't be blindsided in a week. If you haven't started yet, go ahead and start today. So anyways, let's continue to move on here. Um, give me one second, I'm gonna share my screen. Maybe. Trying to make this a little bit bigger for us. That's all right. I'm going to do this without making it bigger, and you guys will see exactly what we're looking at. All right. Does everyone see my screen here? Perfect. So, how many of you know what the lead generation model is? Many of you do. So I can't see all of your faces, but go ahead and uh, everyone except Alex. Alex, I don't want you waving to us because it looks like you're driving, but everyone else, go ahead and participate as much as you can for me. It helps out um, with the energy in this, in this session, especially since we're doing it remotely. But we have at the top prospecting and marketing. We look at this as almost like a funnel. So if you look here, we've got, we're gonna be capturing leads. Um, we've got leads and um, contacts on either side. So a lead, the definition is a one-way or offer-based touch program. So who can give me an example of a lead? Make sure you unmute yourself. A lead could be uh, any club organization you're a part of just by talking to people there. Exactly, exactly. Um, it could be a uh, Facebook advertisement that you put out. It's a one-way offer-based touch program. It could be um, you still need contact information for that person. So, I mean, if, even if, with this example, you could say if you have a name, address, and phone number that you mail something to someone, that would be considered a lead. Um, but that's coming in from our prospecting. Now, number three here is going to be our contacts. That's going to be interactive and value-based touch programs. So what's an example of that? Yeah, you could put your friends and family in there. It's also going to be some type of touch campaign that you're going to be re, um, 
That wouldn't be cold calling, would it? Cold calling would be more under leads. Um, either way, we're still going to be looking at this is the captured area and we're connected. So we're just looking to collect data and collect people's names and information and then push it through the funnel. Um, so that's where, you know, Jeff Glover talks about, you just want to pile people into this funnel and then our lead follow-up is where we're pushing them through the funnel. So that's where, you know, we talk about all the time in our coaching program, um, there's magic in the follow-up and that, that is so true. Um, I say that so often, my team last year decided to actually take a photo of me and put uh, a little Harry Potter symbol in glasses. Ryan's laughing about it right now. They put that on me and made me look like Harry Potter talking about magic. But anyways, um, that's truly what it is. We're pushing people through this funnel um, by following up with them. And that's where our cultivate phase is. Now, how do we cultivate and how do we lead follow up? Who knows? Smart plan. Smart plan, Sophie said. Luckily, Gary Keller has made this very easy for us today. Um, <laughs> Sorry, I'm, in, I'm getting more people into the room here. Uh, but yeah, Gary Keller's made it really easy that if we set all of their information up, all we have to do is click a couple buttons and now for the rest of that person's life, they're going to be hearing from us at least through an email. Um, what's another way we can lead follow-up? Your pipeline. Phone calls. I heard pipeline and Sophie, what did you say? Phone calls. Phone calls, yeah, pipeline and phone calls. So pipeline is, if that's what I heard, it was a little bit distorted, but, uh, but yeah, it's following our pipeline and then following up with them. So calling, texting, um, Facebook messaging, um, we're going to be back out to them over and over and over. So anyways, once we take it from there, we go from appointments, active, under contract and close. We're not gonna get too far into that today. Um, I just wanted to make sure everybody understood what that lead generation model looked like. So, continue to move on. All right, so let's really focus in on prospecting and marketing. Um, so in an agent's life, as far as uh, what their day-to-day -day activities, how long in their business do they lead generate for? And I don't mean like how many hours per day, but in their career, how long are they going to be lead generating for? Ever. Sophie said forever, and that is correct. Yeah. So when we asked that question before of, you know, how many hours have we lead generated? That's the first thing that we need to be asking. If that lead generation is not high enough in our schedule or if we're not doing enough of it, that's where we really need to, uh, to focus on. So, so here's a great question. So. Um, out of, let's use the, the top of the top agents, top 5% agents, um, how many hours per day do you think that they are actually doing some form of lead generation? Go ahead and type your answer in, um, in the chat box here. got five hours, two hours, two to three hours, one to two hours, five to six hours. Yeah, and I would say it's going to be probably somewhere between three and four hours of some sort of lead generation that they are doing. Now, that doesn't just mean that they're picking up the phone and calling their database for that amount of time. That doesn't mean that they're just going to be calling expireds or for sale by owners or, um, you know, putting on events, but it's going to be all of these items together. Um, there was an agent, one of the top agents in our area years ago. Um, they hire someone to do it for them about four hours a day. You know, that's a great example of, yes, their team is also lead generating. They are also doing it as well. Um, it's something that doesn't stop. Jeff Glover, um, who was I just talking? Mike Arco, we were just talking about that. How many hours did Jeff Glover say he was lead generating? Uh, st at least two or three every day. So Jeff Glover sells, what's he sell? Maybe 1,500 homes a year? Yeah. Is that about right? Yeah. So 1,500 mm -hmm. homes a year. Does he have the ability to stop lead generating? I think yeah. he could probably do that. Um, but there's a reason why he doesn't, and that's because he's looking to still grow. So if we're looking to grow and not, you know, uh, 
you know, work our way out of the business. We need to always be lead generating. So um, great answers. Let's continue to move on here. You're not going to go into that video. We won't have time for that either. That's okay. So what are the different forms of lead generation we can actually go into? Who knows? Like what are the different categories of lead generation? Call expireds. Call expireds. Ryan and I are big on those. Call Fizbo. So I said hold calls. Mike, what did you say? Call Fizbos. So I'm writing these in here. Expired. Fizbo. Sophie said open house. Mm -hmm. Sphere. Uh, we get, uh, uh, Charles, he said host meetups. John Murchison said call your database. Farming your Farming. neighborhood. From Deborah, Debbie Ritchie. Absolutely. Um, now, here's another question of top agents. How many of the top agents, churches, any religious groups, so any mm -hmm. types of groups, we have one agent in our productivity coaching off of one person that she actually has lunch with one time a month. Yeah, it's one time a month they'll go out to lunch. She ended up with $50,000 in commission from that one lunch going out over and over and over and over. And do you think that lunch was a painful lunch to go to? Absolutely not. It's a fantastic lunch to go to. And it's something we can do that's fun. So we want to make sure that we are doing that. Um, but yeah, any types of groups that you can get involved with, it could be just, uh, you know, if you're looking to help out a certain specific need. Uh, every year we do an MS walk and we do everything we can to help promote that. Um, but getting out there and touching as many people as you can and then having them um, understand that you are a real estate agent is really important. So anyways, back to the question. Out of the top agents, how many lead, genera lead generation levers or categories do you think that each one of them ends up using for their team? Three. Yep, that's exactly it. So we want to pick, and I want you guys all to do that right now, pick two to three that you want to actually focus in on for the next 90 days and say, okay, this is where I really want to be. And then we're going to actually bring that down, even down to one. And then we're going to be talking about how we can dig into that. Go ahead and write in the chat box, which actually let's just do one. Let's focus that three. I want those in your notes, but let's focus in on one that you want to grow into your business. Go ahead and write that in, in the chat box here. Are you looking to grow on expireds for sale by owners for rent by owners? That is not a typo. FRBO is another category um, that no one calls on except Sophie, um, which is you can find people that are looking to rent. And right now you can call them and say, hey, this is Eric Akbar. Um, I don't know if you know, but your home is probably worth more than what you're expecting because the market's doing so well. And I saw you just had an eviction. Do you think you would like to know how much your house is worth? I'd be happy to come over tomorrow at two or four o'clock, which works better my network where I coach, absolutely. Investor meetup. Open houses. Sphere, really big. Ryan and I were just talking about that and we do a lot of work around, um, you know, expireds and for sale by owners, which do turn into our sphere um, but you know, we are getting more and more just referrals. So expireds, expireds, expireds. Um, the other thing about expireds, this is just a side note, expireds, we have very few of them right now. Are we expecting the market to shift at some point? We are. And I'll tell you why it is so powerful when that market shifts, many of those sphere clients from other agents are going to turn into expired listings. 
and their sphere actually turns a little bit against them because what do you think those agents, um, what do you think those sellers feel after six months without any offers? They're not too happy. Yeah. We look like superheroes right now when we list a house and in three days we've got 25 showings, four offers and three of them are over asking. When the exact opposite happens, I can tell you sellers are looking for help from an aggressive agent and we can show, um, show them value and we can create a value proposition around that. Um, group scale, I think that is a fantastic opportunity um, and we can talk about how to actually grow that. So let's go ahead and um, look at each one of these and come up with an action plan. And I'll just give you a couple quick hitters and you guys can join in too and see what you wanna do. But by the time we're done here in the next half an hour of uh, before we jump into our calls, I want everybody being able to take that action and actually go out there and do it. Um, we can make these phone calls. Literally every single person by the end of today could actually have a listing appointment set. Um, it is a challenge, but by, I didn't say by the end of 11 o'clock, but by the end of today, I promise you, if you work hard enough, you can get that. We're going to talk about how to go after that. But anyways, um, for sale by owners, what is your plan? So if you're looking to call for sale by owners, where do you get your numbers from? I want you to write that down. Best way to do it, use Zillow. It's free. Um, this is the only time I'm going to tell you to use Zillow because we're grabbing value from them. And you know, just look at whoever's at the bottom of that page when we look up for sale by owner, give them a call and go on from there. If you're looking for great scripts, go to gloveru.com. I'm gonna type that in here. We've literally had agents do nothing but read, like literally take a piece of paper and read from it. And they have ended up with a listing appointment on their first phone call. Um, but stay with that script. Um, so anyways, you're going to call and then the last question is put it in your schedule and how long are you going to call? Expireds are going to be the same way, but you're going to have to sign up or you're going to have to use our expired leads. Um, Sierra, I think you're still in here. I'll have to scroll through here. Um, Sierra sends out that list every single day. And if you are not on that list, just email Sierra and she'll make sure you're on there. Um, and when we get those Red X leads in, um, you can go ahead and do that. If you're taking it on seriously though, I would highly recommend all you do is you pull, um, you buy Red X, the numbers are typically wrong. I will tell you that like 80% of the time they're going to be wrong. It's going to take time and energy um, to work through all of those lists and go down it, but uh, you, you gotta stay with it. Um, I have a question about that, if it's okay. Yeah, go ahead, Christy. So if you're sending out all the leads to this, for example, is there a way to track like who's calling? Because what if they get calls from like seven or eight people, you know, like it's kind of, I don't know. Sure. So Sierra just mentioned that she would be happy to add anyone as expireds. And to answer your question, that's something that we always get is like, well, if everybody's calling for sale by owners, why should I call them? Because, you know, we don't want to double contact people. Um, and the reality is this, we have, we have, a massive office, right? We've got 360 plus agents here. Um, do you think we are the only office calling? We typically aren't. Um, there's gonna be a lot of other agents out there. And for those of you who have actually joined in on our call sessions uh, in the morning, you'll notice that there'll be times that I will contact somebody, I'll get the phone hung up on me, and then Rudy Jones picks up the phone, calls them 30 seconds later, and they end up talking to Rudy. Um, so it, the reality is, is you've just got to get out there and make the calls. Um, but no, we don't have like a master database. Occasionally you'll see a Facebook post of somebody that'll just say, Hey, do not call this person. Because if you call this person, they are upset and whatever they're on the do not call list. They don't want to be talked to, or they've asked us, asked us not to call. So you can keep an eye out there. But the reality is you want to just make those calls, um, and get out there. Um, or look at expireds. If you, buy Red X yourself, you can look at expireds from a year ago or five years ago. People that haven't sold from five years ago are shocked. You know, those homes were listed at 300 and now they might be worth 375. Um, so if you call them at the right time, we know that, um, you know, that can work. So we've got a lot of emails in here for you, Sierra. Um, so uh, grab those whenever you can. Um, but thank you so much for adding, adding everyone. All right, so that's for sale by owners expired our sphere. So how do we, what is our plan of action for our sphere? 
And remember, complexity is the enemy of execution. So too many times we want to just put in some type of crazy, um, crazy long list of how we're going to implement this. We don't need that. We need it to be number one in our schedule. Number two, we know, need to know how to, who to call and then three, how to call them. So put it in your schedule, how long you're going to call your sphere or database. Number two is going to be making those phone calls um, with the right uh, scripts, which is going to be, again, gloveru.com has great sphere scripts. And then three, it's going to be following up with them. Um, pretty simple action plan for that. Now, if you want to take that to the next level and make sure that nobody slips through the cracks, I'm gonna give you two other, um, two other tips on that. We can do a DTD2. Who knows what a DTD2 is? Say raise your hand. I'm sure many, many of you do. It keeps us out of what we call call bias because when we call our, our sphere, many agents will watch do this. And they'll just be scrolling through their phones. I don't know if you guys can see that, but they'll scroll through their phone and they call the same five people over and over and over. That's going to help. And yes, we will get m many leads from those top five people, but the reality is we need to be contacting everyone. The next thing is we want to be listening for opportunities. Write that down. Listen for opportunities. I heard someone, I think it was you, Debbie, um, and I know we've talked about this a couple of times, but you talked about a neighbor that had a friend looking to sell, was it, or a neighbor looking to sell? Oh, hold on, you're muted. Go for it's, it. It was a neighbor looking to sell. Um, she actually is listing next week but I intend to go down there anyway. That's it. So I love that I heard that. So her neighbor already chose an agent before Debbie ended up finding out about this. Debbie is still going to go after it. Um, there is magic in the follow-up. So continuing to follow up and creating opportunity. The, the story I was going after was, must have been from another agent. There was somebody that said their neighbor knew of somebody that was looking to sell. And do we put those people in our pipeline? The answer is absolutely. Yes. Even if they're not giving us their phone number, we want to reach out to those individuals and make sure that, you know, hey, I know that you said Jim is looking to sell in the next, you know, three months. Can you, can you uh, give me Jim's number or can you let him know or tell me where the address is? Um, I was at a, a wedding about a year ago and I heard somebody say, yeah, my neighbor is going to end up selling. And, um, uh, I knew where they lived. I knew who they were. And I asked them, I said, do you mind if I reach out to them? And they said, yeah, but I don't have their contact information. I just, you know, we crossed paths and I said, not a problem. I went ahead and looked that person up on Facebook and I just said, Hey, I heard you were looking to sell your home. I would love to apply for the job. I have some time next week to come out and take a look at your property. Would you, would you like to do that? Simple as that. We got a $450,000 listing. It wasn't that difficult, but too many times we're afraid to make that jump because we're like, oh, we're being intrusive. How many of you are afraid to make that call because you'd feel like you're, you're overstepping your bounds or stepping on someone's toes or just uncomfortable with it? Raise your hand if you feel uncomfortable. Uh -huh. So a couple of you are saying yes and a couple of you are saying, nope, I'm no longer, no longer afraid of that. Um, and Elizabeth, you're not alone me included, like when I first started, it was like, are you kidding me? That, that seems like so, um, so invasive. Um, you know, how, how would they know? What are they going to think? The reality is when sellers are looking to sell, they are looking at the opportunity. Um, we talk about this all the time in coaching guys, opportunity versus obligation. Every single choice you make are one of those two things. And when your energy is low, you are focusing on the obligation. Right now I'm talking to whatever, 30, 40 agents, whatever it is, I can't see on the side right now because I'm sharing the screen. Um, but the reality is this, when I talk about lead generation, I know about half of you are like excited and going, yeah, that's the, um, you know, that's the opportunity. You know, we're looking at, geez, we could end up selling a house and making 6,000, 10,000, $12,000, whatever that is, not to mention growing a relationship with this person, helping them find their next home, you know, taking this burden off their plate. Um, others are looking at, um, that's an obligation. Um, it's either not fun. We don't like it. Um, we would be too invasive. 
But I promise you, if your energy is getting lower when I talk about lead generation, it's because you're focusing on the obligation. All you need to do is focus on that opportunity and go, wow, what would that feel like if I did set an appointment by the end of today? Um, the, ask, the question I had was, do I always ask uh, for, to interview for the job? I wouldn't say I say that specific language. I do that quite often. It depends on what we are doing. So we script all the time. Um, and when we are scripting, we are doing different ways of scripting and different ways of closings. Um, so on that note, why don't we talk about how, um, actually, you know what, no, we gotta get back. We gotta finish our thought here on, we're gonna do scripting after this. Uh, circle prospecting, we need groups and neighbors, neighborhood or farming. Um, we gotta finish an action plan for that. So if you're doing an, uh, a neighborhood action plan, best thing you can do is take out, buy a calendar, go out and buy a calendar today. Indecision is the thief of opportunity. So go out and buy that calendar. And on that calendar, you are going to write down specifically what you're doing throughout the next year, what day you're doing it and how you're doing it. The next step you're going to do is you're going to actually implement whatever that is, add the, add them into command, put them on a smart plan, mail something to them, whatever that looks like. I would recommend doing this for at least, um, you want at least 36 touches throughout the year. And it can be a combination of command, emails, phone calls, um, all of those, which by the way, command can do all of these things for you. I have a question about that. So we end up with a lot of people in their database. So mm -hmm. you're contacting everybody in your database 36 times a year. Like how are you staying on top of all those people? I mean, I don't have a lot of people yet, Mm -hmm. But I heard some people have like thousands of people in their database. So Sophie just asked a question. You guys probably couldn't hear it because I think she is muted. Um, and that's okay. So Sophie's question was, all right, if I have a thousand people in my database, which many of us do, how are we supposed to call them 36 times a year or keep track of them? Um, complexity is the enemy of execution. So the best way to do it is one of two ways. One, add them in command and use command to do everything. Command will remind you to make the phone calls. Command will, um, if you create the smart plan, it will remind you to do whatever you need. It'll send out the auto text if you need, all of those things. Another way to do it um, is use that calendar. Um, the DTD2 for the phone calls, um, actually, let me move you guys over to this board and I'll show you a quick example of what you could do. Okay. So this is how we did it years ago and you can still do this if you're not familiar with command because we need to take action right away. And then if you're not tech savvy enough yet, um, which I think is a limiting belief for many of us, but if, you, if you're not comfortable with command, we need to get you into action right away. So the first thing we want to do is create a list of one all the way through 36. Now, Sophie, what is one thing, what's the first thing you would want to do for your database? What's one touch you would have for them? I would call them. Okay, so we're gonna have a call. And how many calls are you actually going to have throughout the year per person plan? Uh, it depends on the type of contact, I think. So mm -hmm. I would imagine probably once a month. So people. if you have a thousand people, yeah, um, that. that would be pretty tough. It would be possible. Um, I'm going to make the recommendation at a minimum four times a year you make the phone call. So that's one through four are all going to be calls. Number five, you're going to comment on each person's Facebook photo, you could say. Now, please don't scroll through like three years ago of photos and comment on a photo from three years ago. It kind of looks a little creepy, but you can find a way, find an opportunity to do that. Um, so you could do a Facebook message as well and just say, hey, just wanted to reach out. I saw this was a pretty unique thing. I know you're a golfer. I thought this was pretty unique. Um, so anyways, you're going to make an intention. You're going to go through everybody's name and maybe you break it down. Um, if you're only doing one Facebook photo, uh, you would do 1,000 divided by 365, or I'm sorry, 260 days or whatever your working days would be. And then you would just say, I have to make five um, contacts through those, uh, five contacts through Facebook on those individuals. 
what we do on that is we actually create our database. What we used to do is an Excel spreadsheet. So we would have all of our names right here and then it would be Facebook post. And then you're checking off, you know, I checked off this person, then you just find the opportunity to find those other individuals. Um, another one, what's something we can do once a month? Okay. We could do a uh, text, absolutely. So we could do six through, uh, six through 18, we're all going to have texts. Another form that you could do um, is you could do a monthly mailing. So that would be another 12. So we're about up to 30. Um, we could do a handwritten card. Um, we could do a, uh, uh, what do you call it? Uh, any type of, uh, holiday card whatsoever. Jeff McManaman is really big on that. Um, I just heard that he has been mailing. He's pretty much done what we're talking about here with mailing and he hasn't talked to somebody since high school. And he showed me a text message of somebody that reached out to him and just said, thanks so much for all these things that you're mailing me. And it was all just random things that Jeff sends out. It wasn't anything specific. Um, and he ended up just saying, come on over. I'd like to list my hundred thousand dollar house. I want to buy a $300,000 house never has talked to him since high school and he was an acquaintance at best from what I understand. Um, so mailing does work. Now, where do you think the plan falls apart? This seems pretty simple. We have 36 touches for every single person. So we have a list of 36 ways we're going to reach out to people. And then going across the top would be all of their names, a hundred, 300, 500, a thousand deep. Where do you think the challenge comes in? For me, the first thing I think of is like, I'm not going to text every single, like I'm not on the texting level with every single one of my contacts. So that eliminates like kind of that. For Call some bias. Great example. So we're already bringing up like items of like, oh no, we're going to stall and we don't want that. Okay. So here's what you're going to do. If you're not going to do it, don't put it in your 36 touch program. This is a form that you can do for everyone. Okay. So very important that we know that. So if you're not comfortable doing that, no judgment around it, but too many people stall right there. They'll put this plan together and then they'll be like, well, I don't want to call everyone or I don't want to text everyone. Then just shut it down and say, I'm not doing it for those people. And that's fine. So can you do like a 39 or 40 touch and tell yourself that you are allowed to skip three of them per person? You could. That's a, that's another, that's actually a, a really good idea. So Sophie said, why don't we do a 39 touch or a 40 touch? And then we always get a pass on three or four of the items. So you have more, more of an option that you can just, you know, put a circle in and that would be a, a, you not doing that. And you just go ahead and move on to the next person. I will tell you why this normally does not get followed by many agents. It's indecision is the thief of opportunity. And it's just like we were talking about, as soon as we give ourselves the option of going, well, I don't know, should I do this? Shouldn't I do it? And we skip one day, all of a sudden it all turns into a mess. Have we ever tried to work out, lose weight, you know, not, not eat unhealthy things. And we go, we're doing it this time for sure. And then you skip that one day that wasn't planned. And all of a sudden your whole, whole plan falls apart. So we want to make sure that that doesn't happen. So make it where you don't have to think, um, I was just talking about that in coaching recently. You don't want to think, I know that sounds counter, counterproductive, but you don't want to think when you get into the office, you want to be able to take action immediately. Um, action is way more important than any plan that can be, that can be set up. So um, everybody understands a 36 touch or a marketing plan for our database. Um, by the way, Lisa Cisco does exactly what we're looking at right here. Here's her big tip. And if you're going to do this, you need to do this. Like I said, you don't want to have, you don't want to think when you're implementing this, you just want to take action. Have all of the flyers. If you're sending out flyers to a, a neighborhood, have all those flyers ready in December by Christmas. Or if you're going to be implementing this, you know, in the next month, put a date and then say, I'm going to have everything in line where all I have to do is take a stack of information, give it to the, um, the uh, post office and it's mailed out. I don't have to think. Um, 
that's why command is so nice. We don't have to think. Sometimes we don't even have to take action with the program. It's automatically doing it for us. So, all right. Um, the last thing was farming, and then we're going to talk about how to script um, and how to gain script practice partners as well. So, um, looking into uh, circle prospecting, best thing that you can do is come up with that flyer program of whatever it is, find the neighborhood that you want to do it for, and then send it out. I'm gonna give you a quick tip of going to everydoordirectmail.com, E-D-D-M. It is the cheapest way to send out the most amount of information. You don't have to worry about addresses of what address you're going to be putting on there or what name or anything like that. With farming, it's not about reaching out to a specific individual. It's about reaching out to a neighborhood over and over and over. How many of you have received something in the mail from some type of promotion of either another realtor or whoever? Um, it could be a, a painting company or whatever. What was the last painting company that sent you something? Yes, Kim, it was EDDM, Every Door Direct Mailing. The reality is this, we don't remember who the person was um, that reached out to us last through a mailing if they sent us one item. Now, many of you can think of somebody that maybe there's another realtor in your area who is farming your neighborhood. You can probably name that realtor and you're only going to name one or two. And that's the point of what every door direct mailing will do. You can do it over and over and over and over. <laughs> it was a green sign. Um, what's that? Number. What's the magic number of how many times we have to reach out to them? The magic number is typically seven times before somebody remembers who we are. This is why I encourage all of you when you meet somebody out at, if you're out at dinner or you're out, you know, uh, with friends and they say, do you have a business card? What does Gary Keller say um, in the book shift about giving out business cards? Don't give them out. Conventional wisdom is typically wrong because what happens to those business cards, everyone? Circular file. That circular file cabinet, um, the trash. Um, how many of us have thrown out business cards we've received in the cash or they end up on our countertop and then, you know, eventually they just go into nowhere. It happens all the time. What's that, Carol? They take their teeth with them. I don't pass out business cards. Yeah. And so a quick script on that is simply just saying, hey, you know what? It's my responsibility to reach out to you. I don't hand out my business card. I'm going to actually send you my contact information right now. And you can do that on your iPhone very quickly. You want to have on your iPhone, if you scroll all the way to the top, see where it says my card? You click on that. And then you scroll to share contact. And then you just type in that person's name and number. It's as simple as that. So share contact, scroll all the way to the top though, if you didn't see that. And it says my card. Just make sure under my card, I used to have the garage code for my house. And you want to make sure any of your personal information is taken off before you end up sharing that information. Or you may have people opening up your garage door. Um, but anyways, that can be very helpful. Now, as soon as that happens, what do we do? We then wanna put them into command or some type of follow-up because will they remember my name three minutes after I walked away from them? Absolutely not because I don't even remember their name. So I need to go back to my system and then create that system where I, the very next day I'm sending that, them out another email or another phone call um, and just reaching back out and making sure they, they know who I am. So if I call them, I text them, I say, hey, it was great meeting you. I know that you, uh, 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 I know you like golf. Hey, there's a golf outing this Saturday. Hope you can make it. Not even something we have to do, but showing that we care um, enough to actually reach out to them. So can you use EDDM for, uh, for apartment buildings? Yes. I'm getting a lot of questions on that. So let me just do this real quick. I'm going to post the exact link in here. So to give you an idea, like to send out 600 um, 
postcards, postage alone on that would be somewhere around $250, $300. Not to mention you would have to buy all the postcards. You would also have to find addresses for all of those individuals, then print the labels, put them on there, hand stamp every single one of them, or find a company that'll do it for you. With every door direct mailing, you literally just take a stack of whatever you want to send. If it's envelopes or just pieces of paper, I think you can go up to like nine by 15 inches, something like that. Um, and all the post uh, postman does is take it and gives it to every single mailbox. So you don't have to worry about putting the addresses on there or anything like that. You can keep doing it to the same location over and over and over and over. Um, our team has done this and it's been very successful with when we find a buyer, how many of us have buyers that don't know where they're gonna be buying a house next? I think that's all of us. That is a fantastic opportunity. Ask their permission, do you mind if I send out an every door, every door direct mailing on your behalf? And we're actually going to send it out to an entire neighborhood and say, if you're thinking about selling and you're worried about COVID, we will bring this one specific buyer who is by the way, pre-approved, um, will come by if you're thinking about selling or if you know of somebody, please reach out to us. What would you feel if you were looking to sell your home during the pandemic and you heard, you saw that? You would probably give a phone call. Um, so, and you're catching people before they even reach out to their, their sphere agent, if you will, the agent that they know. If we had somebody that um, gave us an opportunity like that, they're normally going to call, or we, we would call that, that agent you know, prior to listing our home. Um, all right, and yeah, farming, come up with like 12 different items that you can send. The biggest thing that you need to make sure that's on there besides the legal items of equal housing and uh, equal housing and the realtor logo is making sure that you have um, your name and realtor. Those are the biggest things. Now you can do value adds of, hey, here are the, all the homes that sold this quarter. Here's this, here's that, whatever it is. Um, all right, last thing that we're going to talk about is scripting and how to end up scripting and what that actually looks like. So how many of you want to take on a scripting challenge for the next 30 days? Raise your hand and don't raise your hand unless you're serious about it. Go ahead and type your name in the chat box. We're gonna do five days a week for 15 minutes. Love this, they keep coming in. Now, what is the purpose of scripting? Ben Kinney, who makes, I don't even know, like $3 million a year in real estate, and he was a cable salesman, I think 10 years ago. Um, he said that there are two things that made him extremely successful. Number one is knowing what to say, and number two, saying it to the right amount of people. That is all this industry is. Carol, it will be up to you on when you want to script. We're gonna pair everyone up, and then we're going to, to move forward with it. So it is unbelievable though, when you can learn how to script and how far you can take your business when you know the right things to say, it's essential. Um, it's not essential that you know how to use DocuSign yet. It's not essential that you know how to use DotLoop. Um, it is essential that you know the right things to say that should be on the top of our list. Um, so anyways, what I'll do is I will pair all of you up. Um, and then we will share our phone numbers with the, that pair. And then I will let you two reconvene and say, okay, well, I wanna do it at eight o'clock every day or whatever. The recommendations I have are this. Number one, we said that there was a, a, a strict time that we're going to be um, scripting at. Um, so write these down. Number one, we have a specific time we are calling. Number two, no side chat. Like we can't just pick up the phone and, you know, hey, Ryan, how's it going? How's life doing? You know, it's sometimes difficult when we script with our good close friends that we're like, oh, you wouldn't believe what happened. Like, or I got this offer and this is crazy. We don't want to be getting into that. All we want to do is strictly go right into it. Um, so when the phone rings, we pick up and we say, you ready to get going? Or you can just jump right into scripting. Um, Simple as that. Um, so we have a specific end time as well, which is 15 minutes. Um, when you are scripting, if you do continue on, we always put an end date on this because too many times I watch agents in bold, in bold, they just say you're scripting forever. Who is going to script forever? We're all going to pass away someday. 
And we're probably gonna stop scripting well before that and that's okay, but we should be putting a time limit on it. That way we don't feel like we have failed. We want to say 30 days and then at the end of the 30 days, we can have the option to continue going. Um, Terry Chimileski and I, many of you know, two years ago, we've, uh, we said we were going to script together and this is the longest I haven't scripted with Terry because she's 10 days on vacation right now. Um, but we literally continue on every single week. We are scripting at 7.30 in the morning. Um, and it's essential that we do that. It's unbelievably powerful. Um, perfect. I love the, the amount of individuals that want to, uh, to jump in on that. So I will pair you up. Um, the next item we want to have is our scripts in front of us. Jeff Longo, uh, when we were scripting up in this room, he would have this big cardboard in front of him and we would actually joke with him and call him cardboard because we wouldn't see him. It would just be a big cardboard wall in front of him. Um, we would joke that he would have all his pickup lines that he was scripting on there. But uh, anyways, it was really all the scripts. So while he was calling, he can jump right onto that script board and say, hey, there's a, you know, an objection of what's your commission or you know, we have another agent that'll do it cheaper. You don't have to think, you just act. You just go right to that board and know exactly what to say. So pull up some scripts. That's gonna be your next action item. Um, I don't care where you get these from. Um, you can get them from your bold book. I would recommend that, Glover U. Um, My KW has fantastic ones. And then you can also can, like whenever we get stuck, that is your learning that's when you're actually going to start learning. So you're going to get stuck. Somebody's going to say, well, hey, I want to go with, you know, Jim in our neighborhood. He sells all the homes. And you need to know how to come back um, with that. Thank you. Yeah, the script books also from Ignite, of course. Um, they are all great. And they normally boil down to about seven or eight different objections, but we can handle those um, several different ways. But print them out, buy one of those po poster boards if you want, but have them out in front of you while you're scripting um, on the other side. The next rule we want to talk about is making sure you always allow the other side to close. Never be the person that just answers the phone and then just goes not interested and then hangs up. Nobody's learning anything from that. You always allow for the close, but make sure you're pushing back a little bit. I see Mike laughing. We've, we've heard that too many times before. Um, so we want to make sure that we, uh, you know, we give the opportunity for the other agent to close. Um, and then lastly, when we're giving feedback, it's very quick and concise. Um, always compliment first and then come up with the critiques. There's going to be good things you're going to hear and bad things. Um, I promise you many of us will be nervous for like the first two to three days of doing it. It's a little bit awkward. After two to three days of doing it, it's, it's fantastic. Um, you know, you're just jumping right in. It's not awkward and you, you go right into it. Um, so... Um, couple of limiting beliefs to overcome with scripting. I feel like a robot and it's not me. Um, Jeff Glover is the one that said, well, you know what, if, how, how are your scripts right now and how many deals are you closing? Do you really want to sound like you is what his objection handler is to that. Do not allow that limiting belief to say, well, I can't change what I'm going to say. Um, for sale by owners, expireds, database, everyone is scripted anyways. They're all going to tell you the same thing. What's a for sale by owner? Tell us, Rudy. Mike, Ryan. Bring me a buyer. Bring me a buyer. We just want you to bring a buyer. How much um, is your commission? How much is your commission? Um, they're like the same five or six items that they normally hit. Um, so we can just overcome them by having the right responses ready for them. So. What we will do, um, we're going to break up into some phone calls. Now, can all of us make phone calls? Sure. What, when, when we're breaking out into this session and you know, I can't force anyone to make phone calls, I'm going to highly encourage you because if we don't do this now, chances are we're not going to do it later either. And we might say, well, geez, it feels a little bit more comfortable later. I challenge every single one of us um, to make these phone calls. And uh, Mike, Mike Rapaski, like, is there something that you want to, do you want to play some music or something while we, we're all making these calls? Do we want to do these live? Well, what we, what we did last time, Eric, was we, mm -hmm. we went into breakout groups for about 10 minutes 
uh, mm -hmm. 10 to 15 minutes and did script practice on whatever script we want to use. I think for a lot of people, the Ford script works if you just want to get time on the phone or if you got Fizbo's in front of you, you want to practice that. So we do about 10 minutes, 15 minutes of script practice. Then we'll bring everyone back together, put everybody on mute so we can make our calls in front of the screen and then um, have the opportunity to every time we get a referral, put it in the chat box so that we can see it. how much, uh, how, what sort of wins we're having. Fantastic. So Mike, you can do the breakout sessions, right? Yes, I can. So I'm going to, I'm going to hit stop on.